So good afternoon, everyone. So it is a pleasure to be with you all today. My name is Helen Brian Johnson, and I am with the trademark side of the US Patent and Trademark Office. And my name is Gwendolyn, but please call me Gwen Blackwell, and I am on the patent side of the house. And I'm a senior advisor to a deputy commissioner for patents. So we are going to be picking up, and I am so excited with Mr. Chico. I'm calling you Mr. Chico. You know what I'm saying? Because, wow, what a phenomenal conversation you had. You dropped some real gems there. And we're going to kind of pick up the conversation a little bit to try to give you a peek behind the scenes in some in in helping you to understand some of the basics of intellectual property. He already gave you a whole lot of school in there, but we're going to try and get in a little bit from, from the behind the scenes, uh, what to think of, some things to think about as you're thinking about intellectual property. And the first thing is, did the mic not fall? <laughs> that's, that's not dropping the mic. Here. You know what I'm we'll, saying? There we go. <laughs> we'll keep it, we'll, we'll share, we'll share. Okay. okay. All right. So the first thing that comes to mind is, the question that, all, that often comes up is what is intellectual property and what are the different types and how do I know, how do I know if I got it mm -hmm. or if I can get it? So let's start out. What is intellectual property? Intellectual property. Think about it. Anything that you do, um, any creation that you have of your mind, that's intellectual property. So I have a question for you. How many um, draw things and, or make movies or do whatever and post it on the internet. You know, your artwork, you post it on the internet. You know, that's your intellectual property, right? Did you ever think to copyright it? Did you ever think that, you know what, what I'm putting out there is important enough that somebody might steal it from me? Did and you make money? Awful. That's what we mean by steal. Make money on it when you yes. should be making money on it. You know, your intellect, it came from you and you're giving it away for free. I talk to a lot of art students um, in high school that are in advanced uh, art classes, and a lot of them post a lot of their works, whether it's their poetry, their art, they make um, videos posted to YouTube and everything else, and they don't think about, I'm giving my work away for free. Um, so we're going to talk about today basically the trademarks and the patent side, but we also want you to recognize that there are two other areas of intellectual property that you have to think about, copyrights. As soon as you put your intellectual property on a tangible medium, whether it is on paper, whether it is on video, or what have you, it's copywritten. So you ask yourself, why would I want to register it? It's important to register your copyright because it puts people on notice. I mean, you can use the C in the little circle. Everybody's aware of that, right? You can do that. However, when you register your copyright at the Copyright Office, which is located at the Library of Congress, it gives you better protection. So if someone comes and then tries to infringe or use your work without permission, you have a better recourse to go after them and you can get increased damages and attorney's fees and other things. So that's one area we're not going to necessarily focus on today, but I do want you to be aware of it. The other one is trade secrets. Does anybody know any famous trade secrets? And if you do, you better keep it a secret. <laughs> Yes, the ingredients of Coke. That is a really good one. But, you know, my favorite one, because I just love donuts, Krispy Kreme. The, <laughs> the recipe for Krispy Kreme is actually a trade secret. And you will not know what that is. And the thing is, well, you're saying, well, how does that work? Do I register it somewhere? Because I've heard those questions before. Yeah. How do I register my trade secret? And I say, you don't want to register that. Nope. Because then you're putting it out in the public domain. And, and it's once it's secret. out there, it's no longer a secret. So there's steps that you have to take for a trade secret in order to keep it a trade secret. So if I have a business process or an algorithm or a recipe or anything else that when it goes to my business, it gives me an edge up over the competition, I want to do whatever I can to keep it safe, secret. You have to take steps to protect it. So I'm not going to go out and talk about, hey, guess what? Let's meet at Starbucks, and I got this new recipe for a donut that's going to be better than Krispy Kreme's with a hot sign on. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to say, meet me at Starbucks, we can talk there about it. Because it's not your pop-up. No, because <laughs> if somebody is at the next table, and they hearing what you're saying, or as the youth today say, ear hustle that conversation, right. <laughs> your trade secret is gone. You no longer have protection. So when it comes to trade secrets, you have to take protection 
the steps to keep it confidential. And the great thing about trade secrets is the Defense of Trade Secrets Act that um, came into being in 2016. And what it basically does is to give a form for those who feel that their trade secrets have been infringed away into federal um, court in order to have that adjudicated. So, and we have a lot to say, but just bring, yeah, and just uh -huh. bring it down with the, with the trade secrets. One of the things you want to think about with intellectual property, you do not have to. Sorry, you do not have to have a science background, a hard science background, or or a science background, or any any kind of a background to have intellectual property. It is what you create with your mind. So you know, think about when you think, for example, trade secrets. How many in here have someone in your family who has that great pound cake? recipe that's me and i'm not giving it up well we're gonna have to talk about that no i'll make you a cake but i give you my right <laughs> exactly all right but i mean the, the fact of the matter is that there are so many of us in our families in our history in our culture that we've got lots of things that we, hot sauce um barbecue sauce different things grandpa's barbecue sauce that's been passed down from generation to generation to just one member in the family that grandpa thought that you could have it you you know he could entrust you with it but there are things that, and there are things that are being created right now that could actually be used as trade secrets if you decide that you want to get into commercializing it. You want to get into putting it in the marketplace. So intellectual property, it is what you create with your mind. It's your property. And you have, and what we're here to do is to just encourage you that as you think about, if you have an idea that you want to use to start a business, or you've already starting a business, started a business, and you want to scale and expand, Think about what your type of intellectual property might be. Now, Gwen has already talked about patents. She's talked about trademarks and copyrights. I'm sorry, she's talked about patents and copyrights and trade secrets. And I'm going to talk about trademarks. Uh, so what is a trademark? A trademark is really one easy way to say it. It's your brand. It's what, how you, your face, how you put your face in the marketplace, how you want people to know that you are the source of the goods or services. If you've got a product, Mr. Chico's got his grips, and there are other people that have different types of grips, but he wants them to know that this is Gaines sports equipment. He wants them to come and ask for those grips. Then that's when a trademark comes into place. A trademark doesn't tell you what the thing is. It tells you who is providing the product or service. So a trademark needs to do two things. It needs to identify you as the source of the goods or services, and it also needs to distinguish you, your goods or services from those from somebody else who is selling the same goods or services. Lots and lots and lots of people have restaurants, for example, but you know the particular restaurant you go you want to go to for a particular uh, particular meal. If you start seeing someone uh, who has a similar brand or has a similar look, or let's say it's a, let's say it's a candy bar. Simple thing is a candy bar. You've got, you got, you know what a Snickers bar looks like. It looks different from a Butterfingers, okay? But if you go and you buy this candy bar that looks like a Snickers, but it actually turns out that it's a Butterfinger and you don't like peanut butter, guess what? There's a the problem there. So the trademark, trademark can be anything. It, it, well, anything that you can use to identify yourself as the source, your, you, your business as the source and distinguish. It can be a word. It can be a group of words. It can be a slogan. It can be a color. Oh, yes, it can be a color. So let's say, for example, you want a package delivered. You want a package delivered. And you say, you know what? I want that brown company. Who am I thinking of? UPS, yeah. right? Okay, if I want, um, let's say I'm, I'm out in farm country and I got to get a new tractor, man. I got to get a new tractor. And the only, I want the green and yellow one. Which so one is that? All right. So let's say, um, okay, uh, it is that time. Valentine's Day is coming up, and you got to get that special someone, some Tiffany. jewelry. Tiffany? I didn't say Tiffany. I said a color. Well, you were going to give the color. I'm just saying, did I hear Tiffany? Yes, we're going to go with that. <laughs> that you get something in that, that, that blue box. It's called Robin's Robin Egg Blue. Blue. As opposed to one that's in just a cardboard box that's brown. Which one you want? Cardboard box. Okay. Okay. The color, the color, Robin's egg blue. Without even hearing the word Tiffany, that's what it brings to mind, and that's how a color can serve as a trademark. It doesn't tell you what it is, but it tells you who. It tells you Tiffany's. 
when you see the color brown on the, the delivery van, package delivery van, or you hear UPS, or you see those very fine people walking around in the blue, blue the brown outfits, you know that that's UPS. You see a blue van, who, who's that? Who's, if, and they're delivering packages, who's that? Okay, mm -hmm. so there anything that you can use, you could even use um, a smell, a scent, uh, so long as it does, so long as it's able to distinguish what your products or goods or services from someone else, you can use a scent. For example, Play-Doh, the smell of Play-Doh is a trademark. And who does that work with? Children. And who are the, who are the ones that are driving consumers, consumerism? Kids. Okay. My kids, when they were younger, we, they couldn't even read. We're driving to the car and I say, all right, it's time to eat. What do you want? They can't read. Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, they're pointing because they see all of the different trademarks. It could be a word. It could be a design. It could be a combination of word and designs. It could be a symbol. It could be uh, the, the chimes, like the little uh, little uh, doughboy. <laughs> That's a trademark. Or dope. Yep, That's exactly. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> the NBC chimes. Ding, ding, ding. That's a trademark. Mm -hmm. So... However you decide that you want to put yourself in the marketplace in the way that your customers are going to know that you are the source of the goods or services that you're providing, that is, that is a way, that is a trade, that can serve as a trademark. Now, the thing is, when we're talking about intellectual property, it's important to understand you, you, they can exist, they can coexist. Yes, they can. Mr. Chico, he had, he talked about a patent. He talked about his trademark. And there could be other things. It could be could have a copyright. He might have a trade secret. So when you are thinking about starting a business or expanding your business, you want to think about what kind of intellectual property might I have? He mentioned something very important, which is, hey, know before you go. He didn't quite say it that way, but I think that's he was saying. Do your, do your research. Because one of the first starting points is, you need to think about, get some education on the types of intellectual property and what type you might have. We didn't talk about patent okay. stuff. Pardon? We didn't talk about patent stuff. Please talk about patent stuff. I don't know if you were going to go on. No, go for it. I just wanted to make sure that they got the rest. Give them the patents. Okay. So. <laughs> I love Helen. <laughs> We've worked on many projects together over the years, and I just love her energy. And she knows that it's normally the other way around. Normally, I'm the one saying, don't forget trademarks. Don't forget trademarks. So, yeah, so she's telling me that. Yeah, okay. So when it comes to patents, um, everybody thinks, I got to get a patent. I got to get a patent. I got to get a patent. And I agree with Helen that when you're starting a business, when you're looking at everything that you're doing, you need to look at it in a holistic view. Think about, I have an IP portfolio. You know? When you go out and talk and you drop, yes, my IP portfolio is. He's like, you like the sound of that, right? My IP portfolio. But that is thinking about having your patents, your copyrights, your trade secrets, whatever. That falls within it. And so when you're thinking about innovation and inventions that you might have, Helen talked about how branding your company, branding your business, branding your product or your service is important when it comes to trademarks. When it comes to the patent side of the house, there are three different types of patents that you could potentially get. So the first one is, um, I'm sure Mr. Chico has a utility patent. Design. Oh, design. Yes. Oh, I was going to yes. get to that one too. Design. Okay. So utility patents are um, enforceable from 20 years from date of filing. It covers things such as the function, how it's made, what have you. So the way these chairs are made or the desktops or glasses, composition, anything like that, that's like a physical for the most part, not all, because there are business method patents, but that's a whole nother beast in and of itself. Um, those are usually covered by utility patents. Um, as I said, they are good and enforceable from 20 years from date of filing. It's basically a quid pro quo system saying, you as the inventor, tell the PTO how you made it, how it's done, what's in it, and then they give you a limited monopoly here in the United States only, okay? So one thing I need you to understand is patent rights are territorial, meaning it's only good in the jurisdiction for which you get it. Same for so, trademarks. Yes. Oh, that's a really interesting thing. Yep. Yeah. So I, um, I did a long-term TDY, um, temporary duty at our Midwest regional office in Detroit. And one of the things I used to love saying to my kids was, 
hey, y'all, mommy has an office on the Detroit River, and I see Canada across the river. That's where the office is located. And they would laugh at me saying, yeah, right, you see Canada. No, I do see Canada. But I would also get questions from many that would come into the office that didn't kind of know what a patent covered. They would say, well, it's good in Canada, too, since it's right across the river. I mean, we can see it. And I'm like, no, it's only here in the United States. If you want a patent in Canada, you've got to go to the Canadian Patent Office, vice versa with Mexico on our southern border. So keep that in mind. There is no such thing as an international patent. There is an application process in an international realm, but that's something else altogether. It does not give you patent rights in all countries. So please be aware of that. Um, another thing while I'm thinking about it, if anybody ever tells you, that they can get you a patent, say thank you very much for your time and walk away. And the reason I'm gonna tell you that is I'm a supervisor of an art unit. I have about 15, 16 examiners that deal in polymeric chemistry. So if somebody came up to me and said for one of my examiners, um, this should be a patent, right? I was like, well, you need to talk to the examiner because nobody knows that case better than the examiner that's examining the case. Right? I don't care if I review it or whatever. That examiner is the one that's done the search, that's done the analysis, and has written the office actions with regards to whether that invention is patentable or not. So if I, as a supervisor who work at the patent office, can't say definitively, oh, yes, that's patentable on an application, then how can anybody outside of the patent office tell you that? So just really be aware of scams because there's a lot out there. I met a woman in Detroit who came to my office and there was nothing I could do for her. She had spent $10,000 going to this company that said, well, we'll file an application for you. And all they filed was a provisional. They took her notes, they photocopied it, slapped the header on her and sent it in. And what did she get out of that? A $10,000 debt. And there was nothing that I could do for her. So keep that in mind. Um, I like to joke and have levity, but in this, I'm serious. Scams are out there. People will try to take your money if they can. If now, it's valuable, people are going to try and steal it. Yes. Right? They're going to do that with tangible property, and they will do it with intellectual property. So that's why it's important to know what kind of intellectual property you have. Yes. Can we get so, to the next, next slide, please? And so when you come to design patents, design patents are good for 15 years from issuance which is different from a utility or a plant patent. And the design goes to the ornamental, the look of how it is. Um, so these chairs, how they look, would, could potentially be a design patent. Um, things along those lines, the shape of those water bottles that are sitting, the shapes of the microphones, all of that, how something looks, not how it functions, how it's made, but how it looks, the ornamental factor of it. That's what goes into a design patent. Your protection for that is 15 years from date of issuance. There is another patent called a plant patent, which is similar to utility in that it is enforceable um, 20 years from date of filing. The thing about a plant patent is that it is for asexually reproduced um, plants. So let's suppose you're, you're wondering, well, how does that work? Okay, I really like potatoes. I like potato au gratin, mashed potatoes, fried potatoes. French Baked fries. potatoes, ooh, French fries. I really like some good salty French fries. Yes. Let's suppose you invented asexually a potato that could ride out any type of frost because it is a root vegetable, meaning it grows in the ground. So it is very temperamental to temperature changes of the ground, right? So if you create a potato that could withstand any type of frozen ground or anything else, and let's suppose you're able to get a patent on it, well, you just got your monopoly 20 years from date of filing. So... That is essentially the three areas of patents I wanted to cover real quick. But if you tap on a trademark that uh, for, with that patent and get a trademark for the name, how do you want it when you want to commercialize that patent in the marketplace? You want people to know to come to you for this particular potato, okay? Guess what? Even after the 20 years is over, that trademark you can renew for over. So trademark can last forever. And again, that's property. That's property that you can give over to the next generation, the next generation. And we need to be about building generational wealth. Yes. That's how we can, we can do that. You start, you start something and you build and we pass it on to the next generation. And we show it whether it's through knowledge or through actual tangible property or, or in this case, intellectual property, we can build wealth. And it's kind of good that you said that generational build wealth. While patents do not necessarily, you can't roll 
a patent. So once the time is up, the time is up. You can't roll it over and start the period over again. Realize that there are very few aha moments when it comes to inventions. Most things are improvements. They're taking something, they figured out a better way of making it, of doing it or whatever. And so that's where the patents, you know, that's where you can maybe get another patent, not necessarily on the same invention, but let's suppose you um, changed it up significantly enough, you could get another, um, potentially get another patent on it. So that's another way to kind of keep that thought process going when you're thinking about innovation. Yes, there are all kinds of mic stands, but you know what? I know how to make mine more durable, easier. The mic won't fall. It'll do whatever you want it to do. It's the super mic, you know, mic stand. It's a no drop mic. It's a no drop mic. <laughs> but sometimes you want that mic drop. Exactly. You know what exactly. I'm saying? <laughs> and sometimes you don't. So we, what we have up here is just, just, to, just to walk you through very quickly, just what to expect, the process, and some things to think about. When you're thinking about filing a, a, a trademark or a patent, um, so one of the things that Sir Chico talked about is searching. He's, and, oh, and one of the things that I would definitely, when you have an idea, a thought about what you want your trademark to be, we have a database of all the, tr all the marks that have been filed with us, whether they have been, uh, they're pending, they haven't been examined yet, they're, or they are being examined, or they have been uh, registered, or they've been abandoned, or no longer. We have all of those marks. You can search our, our database 24-7. Okay, you can go online and there's a little tutorial there that helps you search. Why? Because if the purpose of the trademark is to identify and distinguish, you don't want to choose a trademark that somebody else is already using. And you, you want to make sure that you don't get that, hey, there's a likelihood of confusion. People are going to be considered, thank you. People are going to be, people are going to be confused in thinking that this is, that, you know, these mark, your, your goods are coming from somebody else. You don't want that. So search our database, also take a look on the internet and see how other people, maybe if it's a word, how are other people using that word or that slogan? Because if it's, if it's popular and everybody's using it, it is not, it's not your unique identifier. It doesn't uniquely point to you. And the important thing to remember is that when you get a trademark, especially if it's a word, you don't get the word, you don't get to, you don't own a word. You're owning a mark that you are using in connection with the goods or services. You get the two have to go together. You must be using that mark at some point in time to promote your goods or services in the marketplace. So people know if you're providing this counseling service, they know to come to you because that's your trademark. Okay. I, uh, can I ahead, just touch yes. on the search real quick? Mm -hmm. When it comes to the patent side of the house with searching, this um, less than six months ago, actually, we revamped our whole search, our public search. It's now called PPUBS, the Public Patent Search um, Database, and we've made it easier. We we received feedback from our initial launch, and then we went in and added basic search features to make it even easier to find um, material that you need. There are, um, we have training, not only CBTs um, right there on the spot, but there's also training that you can view, um, training sessions that you can sign up for and be able to ask questions. So there are resources on our site, take advantage of them, take advantage. But, and if you can advance to the next one, and then we have some questions online. So we're gonna take some questions. This is our. This is just our, a page of our, our main website, www.uspto.gov. Please go. Uh, you can see where those red arrows are. If you are new to intellectual property, you've never seen it before talking to us today. Now you know, right? You can't walk out here and say you don't know because we did tell you. All right. But uh, if you're new to intellectual property, we have a lot of online tools and resources to help you to walk you through it. So many of our pages have a little tutorial that says, okay, if you're gonna do a search, here's a little tutorial on how to do it. So please go learn, get information. If you wanna have help, if you decide that you wanna have the help of an attorney, you are not required to use an attorney to file a trademark or a patent application. No. But depending on how much research and how much time you have, to be, you can learn it online. But if you want to, and you believe that it's better for you to contract that out and get an attorney, then you should do that. We also have a law school clinic uh, pro bono, pro bono free legal assistance. So there are law school clinics. For example, Howard is one of the law school clinics that will help you as a new inventor 
or some, a new entrepreneur be able to file your trademark application or your patent application. You can go online at our website and you can find those resources there, okay? Once you do file, you do want it, one of the main, most important things is stay engaged. You can, all of our information is available online. It's an electronic fo file folder. So you can see what's happening in real time with your application. Has it, been to, has it been seen by an examining attorney yet? Have they issued a letter or an office action? Even if you're represented, as Mr. Chico said, he's like, once you're, once you're lawyered up, they're not gonna, we can't talk to you once you're represented by a lawyer, okay? We have to talk to who your legal representative is. But you can always see, but if, whether you have a lawyer or not, you can always see the status of your application. And that goes back to the fraud. We are not going to call you and say, hey, you need to pay me money. We don't do that. So if somebody's doing that and pretending to be the USPTO, that's a scam. You need to always go and check online to see the status of your application. And you can do that by going online. Okay. I'm going to pause for a minute because Ms. Portia has some questions for us from our online audience. Hey, everybody. Helen, Gwen, I have an idea for a device that requires a utility patent. It has not been created yet. Do I trademark the idea first and then request the utility patent? In this instance, um, remember what Helen said, trademark is about branding. It's about basically having a visual or a scent or a smell um, or a color or something that represents a source of goods. If you have um, a utility, if you have an invention and you believe it's patentable, you'd file for your patent. One thing I would suggest is be careful who you talk to. If you're feeling that you have something that is patentable, I know you want to get all excited and go out and start asking questions and talking to manufacturers or whatever. Do not do that without having people sign a non-disclosure agreement, commonly known as an NDA. If you don't remember anything else, before you talk about your invention with anybody, have them sign a non-disclosure agreement and make sure that it is a strong non-disclosure agreement, not just writing down a piece of paper saying, we agree not to talk about this and each person sign it. Um, there needs At to be, Starbucks. You know what I'm saying? There needs to be consequences and repercussions right. for the breaking of an NDA. So you would go and look to file your patent application first. One of the things you need to also be aware of when it comes to um, filing an application is that if you decide to disclose it here in the United States and you're thinking you might file um, internationally, you'd want to have at least a provisional application at the office first because while the United States will give you a one-year grace period from publicly disclosing your invention, the rest of the world will not. And they can use your public disclosure against you if you have not already tried to file um, here in the United States and use that as your priority document. So. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. Um, as Helen said, you can do it yourself pro se. And I always say, please don't. But if that's the way that you have to do it, there are those services. That, um, you can find help. You can find help there. online. Go to our website and, and get information. Yes, there's the pro bono program that we have. And as Helen said, the law school clinic, there's actually one here. In Maryland, I'm not sure if you're aware at the Uni University of Maryland, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. I love that law school. <laughs> yeah, I graduated from there. Yes, they have a, <laughs> they have a, they have a um, patent and trademark clinic yeah. at that school. So if you need assistance, pro se, yep. on your own, <laughs> on your own, yes, <laughs> by yourself, just go downtown or free. The really. clinic is there. Reach out. To them. And just one quick thing about trademarks: you can because your trademark is your source. You can file your application before you actually start using uh, selling your goods and services in commerce or providing your services. You can there are two different two primarily two different ways. You can say I intend to use my mark within the next six months or so, or you can file your trademark application then, or you can say nope, I'm already doing it. I'm already doing my bath and beauty products and selling them to uh, you know on the internet, etc. You can file the application both ways. Again, know before you go, get online. Re get get educated and see which is the best best path for you. Do we have a follow up question as far as okay. the NDA is concerned? How do you go about getting a strong or conducting a strong NDA? We have to be really careful because we are not allowed to give advice. 
So we are, we, we, we should have started off with that. Caveat. Yeah, we should have started off with that. Even yeah. though we are attorneys and we work yes. at a patent and trademark office, we cannot give, give you it. personal advice on how you should conduct your business. This public service announcement has been provided by Gwen and Helen. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> so back to our regularly scheduled program. We always say um, talk to talk to an attorney. There's a lot of information yep. online about NDAs and everything else. Um, you know, you can find forms online or you can go talk to an attorney, but that's one thing the patent office will not help you with. Correct. In India. Yes. Just asking for you to repeat yourself because you said we we're having a discrepancy of whether it's UMB, um, University of Baltimore, or is it University of Maryland? University of Maryland, comma, Baltimore. Right. The Baltimore campus has okay. the, the law school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where the professional school is. Right. Not University of Baltimore. Right, University of Maryland. Yeah, University of Maryland, of Baltimore. Baltimore. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I have a utility patent, and so I was trying to have it prototyped, and I was talking to several manufacturers that say that they have affiliates in China and this and that and the other, and they didn't want to sign a non-disclosure. Um, so I didn't deal with them. But if if you have someone that's working and they are affiliated with someone, will a non-disclosure ag agreement prevent someone in China from taking your stuff? If, if the person is, the manufacturer's here in the U.S., but yet they have parts and whatever in China. And so they're saying that in order for us to really do this, we need to... It sounds like you need to get some legal advice on that. Yeah. And here's the other thing that I'm going to tell you. The International Trade Administration, ita.gov, as well as the National Institute of Standards has a manufacturing extension partnership. Go online. It's NIST MEP. They specifically work with those uh, small businesses that are trying to do trying to get uh, do manufacturing abroad. Can you give so, me that again? NIST and I. And, yes, National Institute of Standards has a manufacturing extension partnership. It's NIST MEP. Look, we're the government. We love acronyms. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay. Um, and then also the International Trade Administration, okay. ITA. Okay? okay, thank you. I apologize. We are out of time, but we are going to be around at the networking uh, reception. Please feel free to come and talk to us. We would love to, to answer any questions that we can. And we want to thank you all for your, for your time and for being a great audience. Thank you.